geeks and geek at the world over and comic them at large it's time again for ask chuck dixon where you get to ask me questions about what i do for a living and what i do for a living is i write comic books primarily and uh i've been at this for over three decades so i i hope that i have some worthy answers for your questions and here's the first one paul riley when dialogue appears on a comic book cover is the writer at all involved in that or is that dialogue from the artist or editor you know once you've handed in your script uh it's pretty much theirs to do with what they will um and uh, yeah I I, I I i don't think i've ever written a word balloon for a cover uh i've done a couple of you know maybe two or three or four uh cover roughs it's just really rough sketchy examples of for suggestions of covers and um, they've always been used uh, you know I, I guess either they thought it was a great idea or they thought eh, you know why not uh, I, less work for me <laughs> so, uh, these decisions are made probably last minute you know what cover copy is going to go on we don't see this on comics very much uh, right now unless it's meant as a parody or something self-effacing but you know 60s and 70s you saw a lot of this uh and uh, i guess they think it's added value or added promotion uh this one seems particularly redundant uh the hulk namor <laughs> they're attacking me uh yeah they are we can see that in the picture uh, but, you know, that was typical of 70s comic book writing. They're always telling you what you were looking at. Um, so, yeah, sort of out of my hands, generally. These, these are things that uh, I don't even think about after I hand the script in, um, what, what the cover will look like, anything like that. I mean, you know, titles for comic stories are tough for me. Uh, a lot of times I'll leave even the title up to the editor or give them a, 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 a multiple choice uh, of titles because titles never sound right to me, generally. Uh, so, yeah, it's all part of the editorial process. Clint Lowe, if you could write a novel or comic with these characters, which would you choose and why? James Bond or Sherlock Holmes? Well, I like them both and I've read them both. I've read, you know, all of Ian Fleming's work and all of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's work. Uh, Doyle would be a harder act to follow. Um, the temptation with writing a Sherlock Holmes story is to almost make it too Holmesian, uh, to, to follow a formula. Or try to deconstruct the character, which I really don't like. Stories that deconstruct Holmes's character. I think that uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle did a good job of that himself, deconstructing Holmes's character. Uh, he'd be a fascinating character to write, um, but uh, I I don't think I'd want to take a shot at it, mainly because so many others have, and 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 you know you can unconsciously begin writing a pastiche. Now Bond is a is another one I've never considered writing Bond, which makes it more interesting to me because then I would have to think a lot about what would my approach be. And the greatest challenge with Bond is uh, is the villain and the threat. What is the villain? Who is the villain? What is the dire threat that James Bond must thwart? And uh, for the most part, in the movies, they've been pretty lazy. Let's face it, half of the Bond movies are about some bad guy stealing a nuclear weapon and exploding it somewhere. Um, the, the most clever variation on that was Goldfinger because he was exploding a small tactical nuclear device with a, a grander plan in mind than simple destruction. But ever since Goldfinger, it's almost been de rigueur for the plot line to involve a stolen nuclear weapon. And uh, I, I'd really like to get away from that. If I wrote a James Bond novel, it would be anything but that. And that would be the challenge, to come up with a crime as clever as Auric Goldfinger's uh, for Bond to thwart, and of course, all the ups and downs and ins and outs and uh, victories and defeats that happen along the way. Um, but yeah, it, it would be fun. And I think 
um, after only recently, in recent years, I, I, I've read all of the novels. I, I never read them previous and um, have a greater understanding of the character um, outside of the movies and, and greater understanding of Ian Fleming's life and things like that. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, that would be pretty cool. Not, not that I'm that anybody's offering <laughs> me an opportunity to write about 007, but yeah, that would be cool if I had to choose between the two in some weird universe. Uh, <laughs> Craig Jowles, with your versatility on writing in different subjects, crime, superheroes, fantasy, etc., would you consider yourself a modern day pulp writer? Um, I don't, no, I don't. I, I don't think so. Nothing. Nothing against the pulps, but I've never written on the kind of punishing schedule. I know I'm prolific. I know I write a lot, but I don't write on the kind of punishing schedule that these guys did. You know, having to turn out, um, you know, thousands and thousands of words every month in order to uh, pay the rent. Uh, this picture of Raymond Chandler, by the way, didn't have to do that to pay the rent. It's not considered by most to be a pulp writer, but he is a pulp guy, started in the pulps, and uh, has been elevated to literature by uh, the uh, literati, and, and rightfully so. He was a great writer, uh, but he was also a specialist. He only wrote about crime, and that's something I've always avoided, is being a specialist. I love comics. I love the medium, and yeah, I write in a lot of different genres, but, you know, um, <clears throat> It's because I love the medium. You know, it's never never all about writing superheroes or all about writing horror. I was up for any challenge, up any character, um, and figure out a way to translate that into exciting, an exciting comic book story. And so, yeah, I, I guess journeyman writer, I would consider myself. Um, but, but not necessarily a pulp writer. And again, nothing against the pulp writers. Uh, those guys uh, and gals did uh, fantastic work uh, under you know, the most unforgiving deadlines imaginable. It's, in, it's incredible to me. You know, I, I met Walter Gibson, um, the creator of The Shadow. It's just incredible to me that a guy could turn out a novel every two weeks for years. Um, you know, I, I think I'm closeted in my office. That guy must have not seen sunlight uh, through, through most of his, his his younger years into his middle age. Okay, Rodney Rodas. With the revamp of Green Arrow back in the 90s, did you have free run on what you wanted to do, or did the revamp have strict editorial guidelines? I don't, I don't know that it was so much a revamp as a continuation of Mike Grell's reinterpretation, Mike Grell's kind of reboot of Green Arrow. This is before we called them reboots. Um, Grell certainly stayed within continuity and uh, didn't, you know, do anything to alter the character, but he sort of deepened Oliver Queen's story. <clears throat> um, he made it more, um, you know, reality-based, street-level guy, you know, kind of like Batman. Uh, and uh, we just sort of followed that lead, you know, uh, that the sort of government intrigue, uh, cynicism, you know, cynical kind of almost, well, you know, espionage tinge stories and uh, global action, things like that. And we just continued on with what, what Grell did. And then, of course, the change to Connor Hawk, who I did not create. Um, I, I think Connor is a dual creation of um, Kelly Puckett and Scott Peterson. I, I, I might, somebody might correct me on that. Uh, but, you know, it was a, <clears throat> at the period where DC was trying to introduce new, younger versions of their iconic characters. Uh, you know, their iconic, like, B-list characters, like Green Lantern, Green Arrow, The Flash. And, uh, but, you know, even from there, I, I used, you know, Eddie Fires and characters like that and, and continued uh, somewhat the tone of Grell's run, uh, although mine was probably a little more adventure-oriented. Than Grell's was Grell's run tended to get grim, but you know that's what he was doing. You know he was uh, adding depth to the characters that you know previously had not been there. So yeah, I just kept on. Do I didn't reinvent or revamp or you know break the wheel? I just kept kept going on with what the fans expected from this title. 
<clears throat> Sergio Cariello, my good friend Sergio. Looking at sales of comics today from Marvel, DC, Dark Horse, and independent funded campaigns, what do you think determines how well a comic sells? Well, that's a, that's a, um, you know, how do you, what do you say is a best selling comic? And, you know, you've got Diamond, they're the only game in town. Uh, they are distributing comics to a shrinking fan base and an alarmingly shrinking number of comic shops. So as a distribution system, uh, the wheels are kind of coming off uh, as you know, interest in comics and sales in comics in the mainstream begin to fall away. And you've got the Diamond 100, and you go, oh, you know, this book sold well in the Diamond 100, and that book was, you know, number five, and this book was number 11, and these are, you know, hot-selling titles, and everybody loves them. Well, that's really a small part of the story. If we look at the New York Times best-selling list for graphic novels, which is comics, uh, you'll notice something here. First, you'll notice there's a, there's a lot of manga. There's a whole lot of manga, and there's a whole lot of Dan Pilkey, and there doesn't seem to be much else. And the one thing you notice when you're looking at this list, and I've gone all the way to 12, and trust me, I could go all the way to 50, you don't see one Marvel or DC title. It's manga and Dave Pilkey all the way down. And these are the real sellers. This is what sells through bookstores and, um, you know, online services and whatever. Uh, so DC and Marvel, while most comic fans look at them as the top of the game, they're not even in the game. They're not even in the arena. They're not even in the parking lot. They're still stuck in traffic on the, the highway trying to get to the game. And... Uh, it's a very, very sad, sad commentary on the comic business that the actual book trade list of graphic novels and comics rarely features any of the comic material that most of us as comic fans pay attention to. And that's got to change. That's got to change. I mean, back in the day, yeah, we used to appear Nightfall. All the Nightfall paperbacks were New York Times bestsellers. They all appeared high up on the list. But no effort is being made to break out of the uh, <clears throat> comic shop ghetto. Nothing against comic shops. They're, they're great, but they can't be the only game in town. Uh, they're a, uh, a dying breed. And something's got to be done. Now, speaking of Sergio, my good buddy Sergio, uh, yeah, Sergio recently told me that he was considered for a, a project at one of the big two companies. And uh, <clears throat> the editor said that they, uh, they, they, they couldn't use Sergio because his name wasn't big enough. Sergio's name wasn't big enough. Now, if we look again to the book trade, Sergio is the artist behind the Action Bible. And the Action Bible has sold literally millions of copies. Millions of copies. I mean, the Action Bible is, as far as long-term sales go, is right up there with Dark Knight Returns and The Watchmen. It's easy to say that Sergio's name is known uh, and beloved to a much larger audience of potential comic book readers than anybody DC or Marvel would have put on that title. Uh, so this is the kind of blinkered thinking, sort of backwards looking through the wrong end of the telescope vision that DC and Marvel have, this inflated image of themselves as, as kingmakers, when there's people out here, you know, actually creating comics that millions of readers enjoy, I mean, all around the world. I mean, you add up Sergio's worldwide sales on this title, and it's staggering, absolutely staggering, and, and good for him. And this is a, you know, and what's Sergio care about doing a Marvel DC title? This is his life's work. This is his mission. He loves doing this stuff, and, uh, and he's good at it. And uh, I don't know if you know, but Sergio travels all over the world, uh, not only promoting this book, but, uh, you know, promoting his beliefs in general. I mean, I've always known Sergio is this really affable, friendly guy. He's a, he's a blast to hang out with. Just, a, just a, you know, a, a guy with a really good heart. But man, if, when you see him talk to an audience about his work on the Action Bible, man, he just 
he's a firebrand. He just comes to life. He's just he's so engaging. Uh, and it was a, and it was a side of him I, I, I never saw. And it was brought out by doing this project. Anyway, uh, shout out to Sergio. <laughs> Phil Hatfield, how do you organize all your books and comics? Do you have a huge personal library? Yes, much. Uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> it's, it's sort of unavoidable. Uh, I'm a, I try not to be a pack rat. In recent years, I've gotten rid of lots of books. Uh, the pictures you'll see from here on uh, will not be the t <laughs> attest to that. But you know, I, I you know got tons of comic book collections and stuff like that, and and you know fiction. Every room in the house, except the bathrooms, uh, have uh, books in them. Even the kitchen. There's a kitchen cabinet that's filled with cookbooks. They're not mine, but it, they're filled with cookbooks. As you can see, uh, got a lot of books. Some of them. Uh, one of my kids is is really good at woodworking, and he built me a lot of floor to ceiling bookshelves that are in most of the rooms it's hard anywhere in the house uh not to turn and see shelves filled with books and it, you know it's reference it's uh my own um my my own uh work collected into hardbound volumes and all the rest of it but uh you know if if, if you had told like 12 year old me i'd have a house full of books like this i probably would have passed out so, but just over the years, they just seem to accumulate. The last time we moved, which was like 20 years ago, we moved with like 124 boxes of books. I would not be surprised if we moved again, uh, that, that, that number had not doubled, uh, which means I, I, I gotta get rid of some stuff. <laughs> this is crazy. Do I really need a German translation of Nightfall? Nah, I don't think so. But it's, it's fun to look at it on the shelf. <laughs> Aiden Belcher, I'm a big fan of your run on Airboy. I really enjoyed it. The stories and characterizations of the main cast are, were great. My favorite character by far was Skywolf. It says in early letters column that you plan to provide his adventures and backup stories in the end of World War II to present day, which was the 80s at the time. Since the book got canceled, you never got to tell a lot of those stories, stopping in the 1950s or mid-50s. I was wondering what kind of adventures you would have done with the character if you'd gotten to continue with the backup stories um, well, Skywolf was a blast to write. And I, I've said before that I, I based Skywolf, Skywolf's voice, the way he talked, on, uh, on my dad's. And Skywolf would say a lot of things that my dad had said uh, to me and others over the years. But um, Skywolf was a backup, but he did have a miniseries, and he was very popular as a backup in the regular monthly Airboy titles. We even did a story of his dad flying with Pancho Villa. And um, the original Skywolf had that wolf headdress on, which most artists found very, very difficult to draw. And so we, um, uh, Tim Truman designed a new outfit for him, uh, which was a little bit more contemporary, a little bit more badass than having a, you know, wolf's head on your head. And, uh, you know, and, and the character grew in popularity from that. But, um, you know, what kind of stories was I going to tell? Um, if you get the last volume of uh, the Airboy Archives from IDW, there's an unpublished story in the back, which was the beginning of a story arc with uh, Skywolf running into Fidel Castro and uh, Castro's brother Raul and Che Guevara. And the, uh, it had been established, long established in the Airboy titles that uh, the legend was that Skywolf was the guy who killed Che Guevara. So I was going to do this, um, you know, maybe five-part series of uh, Skywolf helping the, uh, in the Cuban Revolution and then realizing, hey, these guys are commies. <laughs> and, and having to escape uh, by the skin of his teeth as, you know, he, try, he switched sides, basically, in the Cuban Revolution. And uh, I, I don't know quite what stories I would have told going into the 60s and 70s, but I did look forward to the story where he hunts down and kills uh, Che Guevara, who, if you, um, if you only know Che Guevara from T-shirts, uh, he was a uh, notorious uh, racist, uh, rapist, uh, murderer, just, just a brutal creep, uh, and not the uh, hero 
uh, representing freedom and uh, whatever it is that people believe he represents when they wear a t-shirt with his face on it. Um, but uh, yeah, I was looking forward to that. So yeah, I, you know, I had every intention, but you know, obviously Eclipse had every intention of going on with the book as well because they commissioned um, the uh, Skywolf story that would have appeared in uh, Airboy issue 51 that was never published. So yeah, I dug the character a lot. Okay, um, in a recent video, somebody asked me about ideas stolen <clears throat> from work I've done and, and used in movies or TV. And you know, I went on a little bit about that, but, but I forgot the outright theft of an idea of mine <laughs> that occurred. Uh, M. Night Shyamalan, the, the guy known for the twist endings, the guy known for a wildly up and down career as a Hollywood director. Uh, he always seems to go from uh, boom to bust with his films. Um, he um, was, you know, a big comic fan. And that's obvious from the movie Unbreakable. And always talked about how much he loved comics. Well, you know, he made this movie called Signs. And a uh, very good movie. I, I like it a lot. About an alien invasion. And uh, how one family reacts to it. This, this family in a rural part of Pennsylvania, how they're affected and, and, and react to this invasion by these really, you know, scary alien critters who, uh, you know, appear to be bent on the uh, conquest of the planet Earth. And all of that's cool. But um, I'm going to head into spoiler alerts if you've never seen the movie. Um, you know, so I'll give you a few seconds to turn the volume down. I don't know, I don't know how you haven't seen this movie. You know, you can skip ahead. Whatever, uh, this movie's been everywhere. It's extremely popular and deserved to be. Like I said, I enjoyed it. I thought it was a great film. But the big twist, the big twist at the end of this movie, the big uh, M. Night Shyamalan, you know, boogaboo, jump out of the closet, uh, I didn't see that coming twist, is is that the aliens don't react well to water. Um, and uh, when they get water spilled on them, it's like deadly to them. It's like spilling acid on them. And this allows our heroes and eventually the entire human race uh, to defeat these critters simply by, you know, spraying them or splashing them or pushing them into water. Which, you know, yeah, all well and good. Yeah, that's a really, really clever idea. Uh, I, I certainly thought it was clever when years earlier I used it in a comic book called Invasion 55. Invasion 55 was about a group of aliens who land in the little desert town of Hidalgo Wells, New Mexico. They don't land all over the planet. They land in Hidalgo Wells, New Mexico during a drought. It's like the driest place on earth because they don't like water. Uh, something M. Night Shyamalan didn't think about or decide to ignore in signs was that uh, a, a, a global invasion of the planet earth, uh, if you got critters that don't like water, well, they're gonna run into water. I mean, it's gonna rain or snow, or something. Uh, I chose a place for my story. It was a more localized event, and it was a place where the aliens knew they weren't going to run into any water because water was scarce at the time. And in my story, it's revealed this little boy with his squirt gun uh, finds out that these things do not like to be sprayed with H2O. And it's a uh, they have a deadly reaction to it. And uh, I, I, I just got to, you know, I saw signs, and when, it, when the reveal came that it was water, I'm like, crap, not again. <laughs> but what are you going to do? What are you going to do? You know, you're going to, who's going to go to bat for me? Uh, who's going to, who's, you know, who's going to hire the lawyers to go after M. Night Shyamalan, who will just sit on the witness stand and say he never saw my comic? And uh, it's just one of those ideas that was out there. So, um uh, Hey, if you're interested in reading Invasion 55, you can, if you missed it the first time around, you can read it for free and in color for the very first time at Arctoons. So you might want to head over to Arctoons and you can read Invasion 55, the three issue miniseries by me and Lido Fernandez from the beginning in glorious, fabulous color. All right, what's your watching? I'm getting more and more questions because people are saying they, they like. Uh, my recommendations, uh, some people saying they rely on my recommendations. So I, I'm going to do a public service to everybody 
and um, tell you what I've been watching lately. Like a lot of people, get a little tired of the streaming services. It all seems like uh, you walked into a um, ice cream store in the Soviet Union. There's only one flavor. Uh, so you got to make a choice, you know. Am I going to take a chance on some, you know, cookie cutter entertainment created for the streaming services? Or am I going to go watch something I know is good? <laughs> so, with that said, The Dirty Dozen. You know, I, I wanted to watch The Dirty Dozen after one disappointing streaming outlet entry after another. Let me, let me watch something I know is good, something I've seen a bajillion times, and I've enjoyed every single time. The Dirty Dozen, in case you've never seen it or ever heard of it, uh, I can't imagine you haven't. <clears throat> it's a film made in uh, 1967. It's based on a novel by E.M. Nathanson. The basic plot is 12 uh, prisoners of the American Army uh, during World War II are offered a chance to commute their sentences from either, you know, 20 years hard labor in Leavenworth or even hanging. Uh, they're going to get a chance to commute their services if they go on a suicide mission behind enemy lines to destroy a French chateau packed with Nazi officers. And uh, it's got a terrific ensemble cast led by Lee Marvin. Uh, you got John Cassavetes, Charles Bronson, Clint Walker, Jim Brown, Donald Sutherland, Robert Ryan, Ernest Borgnine, George Kennedy. I mean, the list goes on and on and on of, of, of terrific actors that were in this flick. And it is a, it's a it, unabashedly vicious movie. At the time, and people kind of forget this, um, that they weren't alive then, they didn't know it, is that this film was shockingly violent for an A Hollywood picture, just shockingly violent. There's an enormous body count. There's a very casual attitude toward human life in this, particularly for Nazis. It's also got a really, it's got, it's got a mean streak to it. It's also very funny. It's, it's a darkly humorous. Uh, there's a, a ton of great lines, takeaway lines. And the, the action climax is astounding. It's just, just fantastic action climax. Now, my only problem with this movie, and I've discussed it with videos before, and I love this movie. I love this movie. I, I've lost track of how many times I've seen it. I've seen it at least once a year since its release. I don't know how many times I saw it at theaters when it was released. Um, but it, um, my only problem with it is the missed opportunity in the third act. Here's Maggot, played by Telly Savalas. Now, if you've seen the movie, you know he's like the most dangerously psychotic of the 12 felons that they've recruited. I mean, he's just a total nut job and utterly unpredictable. And he's um, just just a nasty piece of work. And Lee Marvin, the commander of the 30 Dozen, realizes this early in the film. But he can't kick uh, Telly Savalas off the team because the deal with the army is they either all go or they all go back to prison. So if one of them fails, they all fail. So he has to keep Maggot on the team. He has no choice. And But my thing was, my problem with it is he made no provisions to make certain that Maggot didn't go off the reservation once they landed in France. He knows this guy is totally uncontrollable. He's a complete loose cannon. He's got every screw loose that you could have loose. And yet he relies on him for an integral part of the mission when they get to the, uh, the target area. And I always thought, you know, wouldn't have been better if Lee Marvin had said to, you know, Charles Bronson and Jim Brown, when we get to France, kill him. Like as soon as we've landed, as soon as we've gathered together at our, our gathering point, kill this guy. Because we can't have him on the mission. And in my version of the story, they do try to kill Telly Savalas, but he, he gets away. Now he's a real loose cannon and he's pissed. He's pissed at his own teammates even more than he was earlier. And he didn't like them all to begin with. Uh, but now he's even more dangerous. And now it's a, a suspense element because you don't know when he's going to show up. You know, because he is. You know he's going to show up. He knows the plan. He knows where they're going. He knows every step of the operation. And even though in the... 
of basically screwing things up. He's part of a deconstructed plot line because he goes a little wild before they were supposed to, and they have to change their plans accordingly. Um, in the version I have in my head, it's even more suspenseful because you don't know when he's going to show up. You know, this is sort of, you know, it, it, with all the other suspense elements in the film, there's, there's another layer of tension added that I think would have made this even cooler. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm polishing a gem that's already polished, uh, but just, you know, just that's my ideas. It's, it's, it's what happens when you're a writer. It's irresistible. You're looking at the story going, oh, man, I would have done this. <laughs> oh. Another one, another old reliable I turned to was Dark of the Sun. Another movie released around the same time, maybe shortly after The Dirty Dozen, follows The Dirty Dozen's um, uh, sort of feel for uh, a war action flick. And, it, and this one's extraordinarily violent. I had to, this, this film had to be deeply edited before release because there's some crazy, crazy stuff happens in this movie. And basically it's about Rod Taylor. He's a mercenary uh, in Africa. And his task is to see a train into this embattled part of the Congo uh, to rescue a bunch of like missionaries and other European people who are trapped behind guerrilla lines and also bring back a uh, about 50 million dollars in uncut diamonds and um, this movie is as close to a movie version of a 1960s men's sweat magazine as you will ever see in your life i mean it's like every frame of this film could have been on the cover of you know true men or or stag or one of those uh, magazines that uh I used to see down at the uh, the barber shop, and uh, it's it's just a terrific flick, directed by Jack Cardiff from a novel by Wilbur Smith, uh, and a, a great cast: Rod Taylor and and Jim Brown again in uh, an, another war action flick. But uh, if you if you just want to watch a you know just a balls out, sweaty, manly <laughs> shoot 'em up, you really can't do better than this one. And uh, it's got some terrific chases and gun battles and, and all the rest. The, 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 uh, the poster's a little hysterical, but this movie almost reaches this level of madness. Okay, another movie I watched recently is Billy Wilder's 123, which has the distinction of being James Cagney's last feature film. Now, this is um, it's a, uh, a Cold War comedy. Uh, yeah. Uh, Jimmy Cagney plays the Coca-Cola executive working in Berlin at the time when the uh, Soviets had divided the city in two. Uh, and, uh, but, but before the wall goes up. So there's still direct interchange between the two. And it's very much a farce, very much the kind of Billy Wilder movie uh, where Cagney has to, uh, for various reasons, make deals with Soviet officials. And uh, it, it all involves uh, Pamela Tiffin, who's the daughter of uh, the big executive back in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, uh, it's, it's her, his daughter is traveling Europe, and it's up to Jimmy Cagney to look after her. But uh, unfortunately, she manages to uh, slip across the Iron Curtain and hook up with Hort, Horst Buchholz, who is this adamant, crazed, um, big fan of Joe Stalin. And they decide they're going to get married. So this, this capitalist princess is going to marry this down-and-out, loudmouth, <laughs> opinionated uh, communist. And Cagney has to deal with all of this in typical Billy Wilder crazy fashion. Things just get nuts in this movie in a good way. Um, it's all shot on, on real locations, although they had to build a new Brandenburg Gate because while they were filming the movie the Russians built the Berlin Wall. And um, which, which they, they, the building of the Berlin Wall is what they blame for the failure of this movie, the box office. It's a very funny movie. It should have been an enormous hit. But they said that the Berlin Wall was such a downer. People didn't want to see a movie set in, um, you know, this setting. So, uh, but it's funny and... and this is a great swan song performance of Jimmy Cagney as a lead 
it, he he owns this movie beginning to end. He does these rapid fire monologues. I don't know how in the hell he remembered all the things he had to say, uh, but he just commands this movie beginning to end, and he's very very funny. If you've never seen the movie, you really need to check it out. Um, another movie I watched, which I hadn't seen before, uh, it was new to me, even though it's made 1950, is Shakedown. And it, it gets billed as a noir film, but it's really not. Uh, noir, people call noir, any movie noir that, that was filmed in black and white and, and the guys were wearing fedoras. Uh, but the, it's it features Howard Duff as a uh, eager beaver uh, who wants to be a newspaper photographer, and he will do anything. And I mean anything to get a job on one of the big city newspapers. So he's played as, you know, a complete heel. And he's aided and abetted. The, the thing that really made me want to see this movie is that not only Howard Duff, who was a terrific actor, uh, n never became the big star. I think he should have. A huge star on radio. Uh, you've seen him a million times. I and mean, he was in like Charlie's Angels and stuff like that. He, he was this character actor. Uh, but the big attraction for me was that in the movie with him are also Brian Dunleavy and Lawrence Tierney, who, uh, you know, two of the big, biggest heavies uh, in Hollywood at the time. Just uh, always fun to watch. And just, wow, Howard Duff against those two guys? Yeah, I got to see this. So it was a lot of fun. As you can see here, he's a total heel. Uh, he, he comes upon a guy uh, whose car has run off into the river, and he insists the guy wave to him before he goes and gets help. So he gets his picture for the, uh, the front page of the paper. Just just a complete creep. Uh, they don't make movies like this anymore where the lead character is just a heel who gets his comeuppance in the end. Uh, but I wish they would. I wish they'd make more. I mean, uh, movies like that are fascinating. I don't want to watch Goody Two Shoes Perfect uh, Heroes. I don't, I don't want to watch the same movie over and over and over again. Hollywood understood that back in the day and made a, a great variety of films much greater than they make today where everything just seems to be stamped out by a factory or a program by a computer, literally. Hey, if you want to contact me, if you have questions, suggestions, pictures of your dog, your cat, I don't care. You know, maybe, maybe you bought a really cool comic lately and you want to show off. Uh, send all those things along to brunobookstore at gmail.com. Brunobookstore at gmail.com for those of you who are only listening to this. And it's the most direct route to get a hold of me and get your questions here on the big show and get your name mentioned on the internet. How cool is that? How hard is that to accomplish? Um, I got two back-to-back -back releases here. These uh, The latest two Levon Cade novels were released a month apart for your big summertime reading. Perfect beach reads. Um and uh, the latest one is Levon's Range. If you read Levon's Prey, you'll know Levon had to get out of Alabama in a hurry. And he ends up in Idaho, where uh, he's trying to live a life of peace, but trouble follows him all the way across the United States. And uh, they're both available on Amazon. And both will be available on audiobook soon as well. Hey, I want to thank all of you for watching, all of you for listening. If you, if you super thanked me, you're, you're awesome. Uh, and uh, if you hit those like buttons to spread the word about the channel, I appreciate all of it. And I will see every single one of you, I hope, down the road.